my marker. Entrepreneurship and small business management. Entrepreneurship and small business management. All right. And this is going to be the third lecture in this series, lecture number three, and it is the seventh class that I have now taught on Twitch. So, let's begin, oh, oh today's topic for the lecture is the following business ideas business ideas where do they come from how do you get them how do you use them all that interesting fun stuff okay so the first thing is How to recognize, or in a form of a question, how do I recognize how do I recognize a business opportunity? A business opportunity. So take a moment here just to kind of pause and think about the fact that there is a way to recognize a business opportunity, and there are several. So try to think about <coughs> experiences that you've had and, and other things and, and where you would try to find a business opportunity if you were tasked with finding one, right? And see how many of those we end up coming across, right? So one of the ways that you can start, you know, spot a business opportunity is through business experience. So experience, right? So you go to a company and you're working there for some time and you're like, man, you know, they could really be doing this better. And you ask your friend who's working at a different company doing a similar job and they say, how does your company do this? And he says, oh no, they do it just like yours. They don't do it very well at all. And so you start to think like, well, maybe this is a business opportunity. Maybe this is something I could solve for those companies, right? So that's business experience. The second thing is related, and it's personal experience. Personal experience. So if you've ever felt frustrated by not being able to get a specific size of something, not being able to get somewhere on public transportation, not being able to have something be affordable enough, not having an expensive enough version, not having shipping on time, anything that has frustrated you on a day-to-day -day basis could be a business opportunity. If you can find other people that are also willing to pay to get rid of the same frustration, right? So you could look at personal experience. You could look at hobbies and personal interests. Hobbies and personal interests. So if you look at hobbies and personal interests, you can say, okay, well, you know, I really like building these model trains. But there just never seems to be any model train parts in my town. And I can't seem to order any, so I would need to have a specialty business to order some. But I've got a lot of friends that also build model trains in this town, actually. We have the biggest model train expo, you know, all, all over America. So I'd have plenty of business, so I could start this little company to come and import parts that aren't available even for purchase online, right? So you could look at your hobbies and personal interests. Next, there's the process of accidental discovery. Accidental discovery. So accidental discovery actually works the following way. So let's say you start a hobby shop to help people fix their small train parts. And actually, 
you see a lot of people misinterpreting your sign and coming in to get car parts. And they're saying, well, we can't get them anywhere else. Don't you have any car parts? I thought this was a car parts store. And so you go ahead and you go, okay, well, I'll just open a car parts store because everybody seems to need one. That's accidental discovery. Pretty unlikely, but it happens. Next, you could look at changes, just the general environment of changes. So, for example, people are concerned about the number of straws in the ocean, right? So Starbucks is getting rid of straws. What if you could come up with a cup design that doesn't require a straw but still allows you to, to you know, fill it up the same way and everything but is more convenient than a sippy cup or still feels like a straw? Maybe it has a little stub at the top, just the top piece of the straw. And is somehow down, down beneath in the cup, it works differently. Right? Or you could find a way to pull straws out of the ocean. Right? So these are changes in cultural phenomena. We'll talk about the different kinds of changes that can happen that can prompt you to see an opportunity to open a new business. The next thing that we see is personal contacts. Right? So personal contacts are pretty important in general. Personal contacts. And so when you have personal contacts, they can say, hey, you know, my company really needs uh, a new way to handle our HR paperwork. It just needs a new way. And if you could come up with it, we'd be willing to pay for it. But it needs a new way. So if you know somebody, let me know. Right. That's your personal contact giving you a lead on an opportunity. Right. And those actually come around a lot more often than you would expect. So they're good. They're good to know about and they're good to take advantage of. There are a few more that I'd like to cover here because they are important. And, and when you do start thinking about starting a business or running your own show or, or doing whatever it is that you want to do, um, you will you will start to see opportunities slightly differently. So the next thing is trade shows. Trade shows. So for trade shows, you could go to a trade show and a trade show will usually be organized in this large fun place, right? So similar to PAX, for example, right? So imagine if you went to PAX and you saw a video game idea and you just felt inspired. You were like, wow, this is like 4D chess with dragons, okay? And you get to fly the dragon like a flight simulator. And you're like, wow, that's awesome. I just, I, I really think that it just needs like a wizard on the back with spells and then the complexity would just be perfect and I'll build that game. That's you going and getting an idea at a trade show. That's just the reality, right? And that happens. That happens all the time. Um, and then finally, you could look at trade publications. Trade publications. So trade publications, right? Um, I recently mentioned in another lecture that the IRS would be allowing people to have deductions for their loans, right? So you can go to your company and your company will match your loan payment and be able to deduct that off their taxes. So in that way, it's, it's free for them and it kind of doubles down on your payment on your student loans. Um, the first place you'd probably see that is in a trade publication, probably one for accountants. And I will bet you any amount of money that you want that there are already companies preparing or are prepared to have and onboard businesses that want to participate in this. And they have a whole system built out and how they're going to file and everything. And they're out there selling this idea day by day, saying that you're going to need to have this. This is going to attract the workforce. They're out there polling students. They're out there doing all this stuff. And that's some things that you could notice from a trade publication and a business that's actually pretty likely to succeed if you do start it. Because there's an actual need for this immediately because regulation is changing. So that's how you recognize the source of an opportunity. The next question we really need the answer to is what types, what types of startups are there? What types of startups are there? Well, these fall into three major categories. New markets. 
new technology. And new benefit. So, a new market is totally new. Totally new. There's not an existing market. So, it's not like you went to all the jet ski people and you sold them a new engine for jet skis, right? That's Or like a new... I don't know, a new flipper in the front that, that allowed them to do jumps or whatever it is, right? So this is like an add-on tech, right? Add-on, right? So they get a new benefit, right? They get a new add-on here, right? So this is something that like you sell a new benefit to someone, they already own it, they're already kind of a captive audience and you're simply making their product a little bit better, right? Um, with new technology, usually it's an add-on sometimes it's a way of doing things a little bit differently so for example um if you used to manually type in all of your pdf documents uh and manually create them maybe now you can like scan handwriting and have it typed up for you and that's new technology and i mean there are companies that do that and so that's a new technology innovation a new market is something totally different it's something like way way out there right so a new market uh would be um search engine optimization right so the first group of people to be like hey search engine optimization is pretty important that was a totally new market right because i mean nobody was doing search engine optimization before them um i mean the reality was way before them there wasn't really an opportunity to do search engine optimization Immediately after Google and search engine optimization became a thing, uh, you really couldn't work through very much. And so, and so a little bit after, SEO became a new thing, right? And so that became a new market, right? Um, when stuff like MySpace surfaced, social media became a new market. They didn't really capture that market aggressively enough, but it existed, right? It existed, and that's, and that's very interesting. So these are generally the three types of startups that are going to be founded. So either you're delivering a new benefit, a new technology, you're leveraging a new technology usually, right? So you're not, you don't necessarily even have to be delivering a new technology, you just have to be leveraging it. Or you're creating a whole new market, right? You've basically found something people aren't even thinking about and you've created a whole new market for yourself. Um, so these are the different types of startups out there. Okay. The next thing we're going to cover is how to evaluate evaluating or again, let me I I've been thinking about putting more things in the forms of questions. So How do I evaluate a business idea? How's that? How do I evaluate a new business idea? How do I evaluate a new business idea? Okay, so this is pretty straightforward, right? Um, or it's pretty straightforward once you know what it is. So the two things you're going to do is you're going to evaluate things either outside in, outside in, or inside out. Inside out, right? So we're going to underline these two and then we're going to draw a line and we're going to list some of the ways that you can evaluate things. So outside in, you're going to want to look at the general environment, right? So what is the general environment right now as it pertains to your startup, as it pertains to your startup idea? So this is the political 
cultural, economic, economic, demographic, and technological. Technological. So, for political, you want to think about, okay, so what is the political environment? So, for example, um, the Senate recently had a hearing with the technology companies about how they allowed their platforms to get so uh, abused and kind of overtaken by, by all these different governments and so on and so forth and the spread of fake news and all that stuff. So that's your political environment, right? So if you're starting a startup that's going to help these social media giants filter this out using some, some artificial intelligence that you've trained or you figured out how to use, um, that's the political environment, and that is a very beneficial political environment for you. However, if you're starting a social media startup that is going to sell information exclusively to foreign governments and allow only them to post, that may not be the best political environment to do it in. At least in the United States. It might be a very good global political environment to do it in because I'm sure they want to post somewhere. Um, the cultural environment is, is, you know, things about like stuff like straws, right? People not wanting to use straws anymore. It's not like straws weren't a problem this whole time. It's just people have finally gotten to that problem. So that's the cultural environment. Um, you can also think about trends in clothing and in music. Um, the economic environment is whether or not people have money to spend. So the reality is if everybody is super poor and things are not going well in the economy and you're trying to invent the new luxury kitten mittens, uh, you're going to be in a lot of trouble because the reality is people don't have enough money for food they're not going to buy kit kitten mints right um your demographic again this is very important so let's say you want to build something for baby boomers right and what you want to build for baby boomers is an amusement park so you want to build an amusement park for baby boomers you know take them back to the 50s and 60s and 70s and you know, have this, like, space captured in time and maybe allow them to relive some of their favorite moments from those decades. And, uh, you know, and you think this is an amazing idea and so on and so forth. And the way you plan on doing the startup is you plan on building this permanent little city that's, like, captured in the 50s and 60s. And so you need to think about your demographic because you're, the baby boomers are aging, right? So if it takes you 20 years to build this, there's going to be no one left uh, to enjoy it, at least from your original demographic, right? So this is pretty important and, and an important thing to consider. And then finally, it, you, the technological situation, um, I mean, you've all heard about Moore's Law, right? So, I mean, I think, I think in the technological situation, you have to think about what's coming in the future of technology. So just yesterday, I was listening to this article that was absolutely insane on, on NPR. Uh, basically, in a completely soundproof space, recording a bag of chips, uh, there's an algorithm now that off of the video recording can tell the difference in pixels and can extract sound waves. Because the sound waves actually move the paper bag ever so slightly can extract sound waves and convert it back into words, which means you can now hear video um, without there actually being sound, right? So you can, you, you know, you can obviously, you know, take your mind to one terrible place or one really interesting place. So one really interesting place is there's all this amazing data out there that we could be gathering without physically being there um, and without having to record it on a little microphone and then pair it together with sound. The terrifying place is, of course, that intelligence agencies are going to be pretty interested in this, considering that they can now listen to you from a satellite. That's messed up. But that's the reality, and that's the reality that we live in. So if that's a technological environment, and you plan on inventing some kind of mouth muffler or some kind of telepathic communication, right, maybe that's a good solution, right? Maybe that's something. So consider your technological environment. It's very important, right? Furthermore, you're going to want to consider your industry. Right. And this is simply looking and trying to understand your peers. Right. I don't know. <sighs> industry. I, I feel like my marker's drying out, maybe. I'm not sure. Um, so you're going to want to consider your industry and your competition. So these are two different things. And they're two different things for one, for one reason. Competition. Right. So if there's wide adoption of artificial intelligence solutions... That means that people are generally acceptant of artificial intelligence. They're generally acceptant that it's helpful. 
And there's just a general understanding. So that's your industry, right? Your industry is the artificial intelligence industry. Now, your competition may be outside that industry, right? There may be a whole huge amount of contractors working there. There might be other solutions that are working. Um, there might be art other artificial intelligence. So there might be intersection here. But it's important to consider your industry, one, for your general level of acceptance. So, for example... If you were in the industry of trying to compete with Google Glass prior to the, you know, distribution of Google Glass, you would think, wow, yeah, I've got a great idea here. I'm going to make Google Glass and that's going to be awesome. Um, and that's nice and that's great. But the reality is when Google Glass came out and people generally did not like it, uh, iced coffee is just too good, and people generally did not like it. You, if you were trying to venture into that industry afterwards, would be like, oh, I don't know if that's such a great idea. Because that, you know, we, we're stuck in a kind of a weird situation here. Um, for competition, for competition, the following is happening, right? For the competition, you need to figure out whether or not you're actually offering something that's going to be at a better price point, uh, more deliverable, easier to deliver, and so on and so forth, um, than your competition, regardless of how your competition does that. So you're going to want to make those evaluations and you're going to want to make those evaluations. And most importantly, right, a lot of people try to try to add a lot of math into this. There's, there's no need for that. There's no need for that. I mean, know your price point and know your competition's price point, but there's no need to add math. You need to understand what the competition does and what it lacks, right? It's because if you understand what it lacks, you can understand how to sell your product, right? So furthermore, we need to evaluate a new business idea from the inside out. So how do we evaluate a new business idea from the inside out? The first is tangible resources. Tangible resources. Right? So let's say you've already got 25 computers. Great. Those are tangible resources. And that's probably good if you're starting a business that requires a lot of computers. Right? Uh, cash is probably the best tangible resource because you can spend it to turn it into any other resource. All right, there's also intangible resources. Intangible resources. So if you have a great business idea and you've gone up to uh, I, I, a world-famous computer programmer that teaches at you know Columbia or University and, or Harvard or something, and you were like, hey, I want you to come work with me, and they were like, all right, fine, let's do this. This is so exciting. I, I'd love to do this. That is an intangible resource. That's something that other companies can't duplicate. Right. Um, and it's a fantastic thing. Next, you have your capabilities. Okay, your capabilities, and this is this is both you individually and your team. So, and this is an important thing to think about when you think about a team, right? So, if you have certain capabilities like public speaking, or sales, or advertising, or invention, or innovation, or whatever, you should look for a team that complements your skills. Right? That complements your skills. Not has the same ones because the same ones aren't that great. Not has the total opposite because that's not going to allow you to communicate very well. You need people that share some of your skills and have some of their own. Right? And so you're building this constant circle where people are connected by their skills and by what they do. Right? And so those are the capabilities to consider. So if you only have the capabilities to invent a product and not the capabilities to sell one, you are going to need to find that on an inside out basis before you feel like your evaluation is strong enough. Finally, or second to last, you're going to need a competitive advantage. Competitive advantage. So if you're moving into a space where there's already a lot of companies doing what you're doing, um, whether they're doing it the same way or not doesn't really matter. Whether they're doing the same way or not doesn't really matter. What matters is that they're trying to deliver the same solution or, excuse me, solve the same problem. It may be with a different solution, but solve the same problem. You need to understand where your competitive advantage is. And that largely comes from, study, from studying your competition and from understanding what they fail to deliver on and from, importantly, knowing what you fail to deliver on, right? So if you were building this HR replacement artificial intelligence tool, right, and your competition is just a, a huge company with all these contractors that work for them that come in and do that, right? You probably can't answer the phone for every single one of your customers and say, well, this is how we're going to handle this where they can, 
right? You probably can't put a living person into every single one of their offices. But what you can do is you can do it at uh, one one hundredth of the cost. And that's amazing. And you can promise that it'll get better over time because your algorithm is going to improve, whereas they don't necessarily know. They can't promise that, right? So that's a big thing, right? So knowing your competitive advantage and knowing your disadvantages is also very important because you're going to have to learn to explain them away. Right. You're also going to need to understand your core competencies, right? Your core competencies. Your core competencies are what are you good at? What are you good at? Okay. Core competency. When you go to Walmart, do you expect the highest quality product available or any kind of big discounter? No, you don't. You don't expect the highest. You expect the best price, and they have the best price. When you go to Amazon, right? Do you expect to, hmm. when you go to Amazon, do you expect not to find something that you're looking for? No, you expect to find everything that you're looking for because that is their competency. You might not get the best price. You might not get the best customer service. You might not get the best anything else, but you will get fast delivery and oh, basically everything, right? Almost everything they will carry, right? So know your core competences because that's an important way to defend your business. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to cover is evaluating internal strategy. So the question that we're going to be asking is how do I decide or how do I compose a strategy for my business, right? How do I compose... a strategy for my business. And this is very important because if you don't have a strategy, you're just going to be wallowing around and going back and forth and nothing's actually going to get done. So a couple of the components of strategy. One is cost strategy. Cost strategy. Number two, differentiation strategy. And number three is the focus strategy. So what does this mean? The cost strategy sounds like the following. We have the best price. So we're doing what everyone else is doing. We're doing a lot of different things, but we are pricing it at the best price. A differentiation strategy is we are like no one else. We are like no one else, right? So no one else out there is like us. We're just a different company. There's not the stuff that we make is better. It's bigger. It's stronger, but it's just, you can't replicate it, right? We are who we are and that's that. And then the focus strategy is we only make, we only make this. Right? So the focus strategy is we are exceptional, exceptional, absolutely exceptional at making smoothies. We don't make anything else. We, don't, we just know how to make extremely good smoothies. We've perfected it. We continue to perfect it every single day. We are focused on making just that. So those are the strategies, but that doesn't answer our question, which is how do I compose the strategy for my business? Right? <coughs> Excuse me. So what you have to think about is the following three things, right? Which is your market potential, your market potential, that's one. 
The second thing you want to think about is the industry attractiveness. And contrary to popular belief, that doesn't mean how attractive everyone in your industry is. Unless you're in the modeling industry, in which case it does. Um, and then you want to think about new venture leadership. New venture leadership, right? So, the first thing is market potential, okay? If everyone else that is doing what you're doing... So, for example, if you wanted to go out and start a big box store, so like, you know, just a big box retailer, you've got just about everything, food, clothes, all that stuff, you carry it all in one store, you know? Can you really compete on cost nationwide? You can't, right? Because, I mean, it's going to be hard to beat Walmart, right? Like, no, I mean, no matter what, you're just not going to beat Walmart. Um, can you compete by focusing? Not really. We focus on what? On buying everything? No, right? That's not, you're not really going to be there, right? So the only thing you can really compete on is differentiation, right? Um, so, you know, we only use local suppliers. So for example, all of our clothes are made in the state, right? Or in the neighboring states, right? And, and none of them are imported from overseas. Or we only buy in the USA, right? Um, or any of these other things. So you're going to need a differentiation strategy. So that's something that you look at, you look at in your, in your market potential, right? You look at where, where things are going to fit. In terms of your industry attractiveness, right? You're going to look at, actually, rather than who you can compete with, you're going to look at who has been successful, right? So, for example, a focus strategy is perhaps the most successful with airlines. So if you take airlines, a focus strategy is saying, we only fly New York to London. We fly to New York to London all the time. We have the best prices in New York to London, right? Because the focus strategy includes a cost strategy, right? Oftentimes, not, not necessarily all the time, but includes a cost strategy in this case, right? Differentiation doesn't really work in airlines, right? Even though every single one of them tries to do it, every single one, you know, JetBlue is just like JetBlue. No one else is like JetBlue. Delta is just like Delta. No one else is just like Delta. The reality is they're all the same because you're all getting on an airplane and you're flying somewhere, right? The, the one bus line is different than a, another bus line based only on its stops. It's not, the bus itself doesn't really change. And if it does, it's, it's insignificant enough that the idea of getting from point A to point B is actually what you're buying rather than a nice seat, right? So your industry attractiveness, you're going to want to look at what's working. Right. What is working for other companies? What is working for other companies in your industry? And what is working in terms of where you're going to f be able to fit yourself in? Right. So it may be the case that you should try a focus strategy. You should try a cost strategy when you're approaching airlines. Right. So, um, for example, Southwest Airlines approached it from a cost strategy. And they were extremely successful because no one else had really done that very often. Um, without kind of blowing up. So they had a much better idea on how to manage risk, and so they decided that the cost strategy was best for them. And then finally, you want to think about your leadership. And, and oftentimes, when you start a company, you're going to be in the position of leadership. Now, unless you give up that position of leadership, which uh, saying the word give up makes it sound like you're, you're giving away something that's worthwhile, but a lot of the times, that's actually the best thing that you can do for your company is give up the position of leadership and retain the position of some control over its creative direction or whatever, because not everybody is a great leader. That's just the reality, right? Some people just are worse leaders, some people are better leaders, but the reality is when you give that up, there's, there's a good opportunity, right? There's a good opportunity for you to kind of excel and be better. Um, so you need to consider what kind of leadership you're running, right? So if you're running cost strategy leadership, you probably want, or you're, if you're running a cost strategy, you're planning on running a cost strategy, you probably want leadership that's extremely good at tracking numbers, right? You don't need somebody that's very good at supplier relations and all that other stuff, and it's very good at networking. You just need somebody that's very good at tracking the costs, pushing them down, tracking your expenses, pushing them down, tracking your profits, keeping them level, right? Um, if you're running a differentiation strategy, depending on your differentiation strategy and the industry that you're in, you're going to want a different set of leadership. But most likely, if you're running a differentiation strategy, you're going to want someone that attracts attention to that differentiation, right? So someone that is extremely good at supplier management, if you are working with very good or high quality suppliers, someone that is very pro-America, right? So a former senator or someone from the U.S. military, right, to run your 
you're, you know, we only buy in America store, right? Someone that truly epitomizes or, or represents your differentiation strategy as a company. And then finally, when you look at leadership for a focused strategy, most of the time what you're looking for is you're looking for an industry expert. You're looking with some, for someone with a huge amount of reputation for being very good at this particular – oh, spelled strategy wrong this whole time – at this particular thing. So someone who is very good in the airline industry, someone who is very well-respected pilot or a very well-respected just industry analyst or expert, um, you know, or – maybe even a very, very well-trained and highly regarded military pilot, right? Someone that really shows that your focus is showing. So if your focus is, is to create the best slice of pizza and you hire some local guy who's from, I mean, pizza's from Italy, right? So let's go as far away from Italy as possible. You hire some local guy from Siberia to work on your pizza, uh, people people that see him as the leadership are going to be like, okay, I kind of get it. Maybe he's got a passion for that, but I'm not really pulling the two together, right? If you hire some Italian guy that's like is an exquisite chef and has spent his life working on pizza, focus strategy, that's going to work for you, okay? So that answers our question, how do I compose a strategy for my business? Um, and so that ends our lecture number three on entrepreneurship and small business management.